He seems to have limitless energy. It's evident in the very quick speech. Well, I don't know, Cheska. I, I don't know if you should be doing that. <laughs> now, Sherry? Going 100,000 miles an hour. Ah, uh, Darren, uh, 120 minutes. Don't exceed 120 minutes. It's fantastic. It's going to be a great show. I, 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 I just can't stand it. He's kind of an evangelist for opera. He talks the gospel of opera. I discovered opera when I was six years old. My mother said to me, oh, it's where people sing where they normally should talk. And I said, what do they sing about? And she said, there's a story of a woman who is put on a rock and surrounded by fire. And she has sisters who fly through the air. And I got up and ran around the table, and I was told to sit down, and I said, that's fantastic. And then the Met came to Dallas, a spectacular rigoletto. And afterwards, when I went home, I can remember this just as though it were yesterday, I said to myself, this is my life. For a while, my parents liked the idea that I was interested in opera, but by the time I was about 10 or 11, my father realized it was serious. I didn't want to be a singer. I didn't want to be a conductor. And he kept saying to me, what do you want to do? Just sit in an orchestra seat and look at it all the time? He knew he loved opera and he wanted to be around it all of his life. And so the first way he found to do that was to write about it. He was an editor of Opera News in the 70s. He was the music critic of the New York Post. And he was the TV host for some of the earliest Metropolitan Opera television broadcasts. After I did that for two years, I was out here lecturing on the ring. After one of the talks, there was a lady on the board, Beverly Brazo. She said, we want you to come see the search committee. And I literally, honestly, didn't know what a search committee was, nor for what they were searching. And the rest is history. I know it was foolish with the lack of experience to take over a big company, but I never had any doubt because the one thing I knew was that I knew opera. His passion for opera is such that it energizes everybody who's around him. It was a learning process for him, working in all aspects of the opera and the company. We did Orfe in 1988, and Mark Morris and his original group, we staged the overture, and then we cut it after the dress rehearsal. We were up until four in the morning, and Spate was the life of the party, anticipating problems, just being a brilliant and extremely spontaneous collaborator. Because I was relatively new in my career when I met him. I thought that everybody else was like Spate. Boy, was I mistaken. I arrived at the apartment that they had arranged for me in Seattle, and the beds were unmade and dirty. I had only one phone number, and I was so embarrassed, but I called Spate Jenkins. He came over, he helped me strip the beds, helped me put the laundry in the machines, helped me make the beds. Which is not exactly what most general directors do. Most do not sit in rapt attention at 85% of staging rehearsals. Spade Jenkins actually sits in the room with you from the first rehearsal to the last. What I do as a general director came about because I didn't know what most of them did. So when we did the first opera here, it seemed logical to go to as many rehearsals as possible because I wanted to learn. And some people might consider that odd, but considering the fact that the man has an encyclopedic knowledge of opera and one of the most supportive souls, it really makes the experience feel very safe. If you go to a performance, it looks very Seattle, the audience. You'll see people in all manner of dress and everyone's equally accepted. And you'll see Spate at the top of the entry stair greeting everyone. When they first did Turn of the Screw and he wasn't sure how it would go over, he decided to do a talk back after every single show. I simply didn't want to get all the letters that would come in. I thought it would be better to answer the questions right then. Well, it was such a hit that he's done it after every single show, including Goethe Dameron. It's an institution, I think, of which Seattleites are quite proud. Everyone's aware of the reputation he's built for Seattle opera, particularly in the Wagnerian world. As everyone knows, Spate really is a descendant of Richard Wagner. You do know that Wagner's birthday is an office holiday in Seattle. When Spate puts on a ring cycle, it becomes this community celebration. And it's very much what Wagner intended. Frankly, if you can do Wagner successfully, you ought to be able to do anything else, because nothing is any harder. He approached me about becoming part of the new ring cycle. And he said, I want you to sing your Fricka. I'm interested in what you have to say about this part. And he gave me a year and a half to decide, which I thought was remarkable. And I thought, I want to work with somebody who has such integrity. I do trust my feeling about voices. And I don't really care what anybody's done. 
or where they've been. If I really believe a person is good, then I'll put them on. Some other places will make you feel like you're underneath them or you're working for them, where Spate makes you feel like he's so happy to have you there at that company. I told him that one of my dreams was to do War and Peace, and he immediately embraced it. I said that I had to have a good many Russians in the cast. And so I went to Leningrad and to Moscow, and I heard all the singers. And of course, 1990 was in the height of perestroika. So we were watching the Soviet Union fall as we were doing a piece that had such great political ramifications. When the curtain came down at the end, and the entire audience stood up instantly and cheered. We knew we really had something. Spade just told me to do my best and that he trusted me. After I delivered my first draft, he said that the music that I'd written for the little girl at the beginning was that of a woman. And how was she going to turn into a woman if she'd already sung the music of a woman as a child? That was so smart. And I was mad at myself that I hadn't caught it. He is an extraordinary force for good, not just in Seattle, but in the industry. Totally, totally dedicated. 365 days out of the year. At the end of Go to Demerung, I pulled him out on stage, and I've never in my life heard an ovation like that. This was a city saying to this man, thank you for years of loving and curating of an art form that we had no idea we loved so much.